I, I have been trying, Erica and I have been using social media to chat with each other for a little over two years now. Um, I discovered her through a mutual friend, Shelly Kramer. Uh, Erica, it, to me, is the epitome of what social media is about. Uh, she's honest, brutal, um, blunt, and really gets information out there the way it should be. Uh, she, she's really, she claims to be an expert at nothing, but she screws up a lot, so she learns from her mistakes. Uh, she is the person behind redheadwriting.com. It's a persona, it's not her. It's someone she portrays um, occasionally, most of the time really, but uh, she's been held by Forbes as a spinless spin doctor, if you guys understand what that means, uh, for her BS-free perspectives on business, marketing, branding, and life in general. She's a business strategist, a columnist for Entrepreneur Magazine, and speaks at conferences across the U.S. On, uncensored, by the way, which she has agreed to behave today. Uh, on the inherent power of truth in business, or as she re refers to it, the power of unpopularity. Uh, I want to remind you again about her book. It's great. It's brilliant. Everybody here should read it if you have any interest in marketing and social media and life in general. Erica, come do your thing. Hi. When I'm not in the South, this is how I speak. I live in Denver, Colorado, and what Stacy just learned about me this morning when he picked me up from the bus station is that I was born in Opelika. Uh, thank you. I haven't, I haven't been, you're, you're going to hear me talk, I'm sure you don't even hear it, but you're going to hear me talking like this for the next hour, which if anybody in Denver gets to live stream this, they're going to be like, what the hell is coming out of her mouth? She's got that funny accent and stuff. But, um, so this is my first time back to Alabama in 38 years. So thank you for having me. I am humbled by the number of people in this room and you make me want to, you know, kick sand and go, ah, shucks. So thank you for taking time out of your day to share with me. Um, there's something I do love very much about the South, and it's the phrase, bless her heart. It is the debutante equivalent of the middle finger. <laughs> and kind of like an, a, a friend of mine, uh, Kevin, who is Unchained Foodie on Twitter last night, reminded me that the phrase, with all due respect, is much the same way. Because you can come out, you can come out and say, that guy is a son of a bitch, with all due respect. <laughs> and it excuses everything you say. And, you know, there's two ways in the South to say, bless her heart. And the first way is, bless her heart. And it's, that translates to, I am so sorry your child got hit in the head by a baseball and passed out. You had to run him to the emergency room. The hotel, I mean, the emergency room cost you $14,000. Is he okay? And the other one is, bless her heart. And the facial express, ladies, the facial expression goes with it. And you get the facial expression before you say the phrase, bless her heart, and that's, oh, she's a bitch. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, I'd like to start by asking, has anybody in this room ever been told to bring it down a notch? No, no you, yes. yes, yes. Um, we're all guilty of it. Wherever we are, we're always in a situation where we are surrounded by people and maybe we're that person where somebody's like, oh, oh, honey, shh, not here. And I don't care for that too much, even though I've said it. This is something you need to know about me. This flashed a little earlier. Um, I assume everybody in here has had at least an eighth grade education. And that means I don't read slides, if that's okay with everybody. Um, the reason I hate slide presentations is because I like people. And I think talking with people is a much better than talking at them. And this isn't story time. So it's not a picture book and I'm not going to read to you. But what we're going to do is we're going to have an exchange of ideas. And um, you're going to like some of them. And some of you ain't going to like me so much and that's okay. 
because I didn't build myself to please you. People ask me when I became comfortable in my own skin because I have an out there online persona. Um, I have an excellent grasp on the F-bomb and I can use it as a comma, semicolon, period, adjective, adverb, noun, verb, and I think it's a conjunction as well. But I can tell you the exact date that I stopped caring about what people thought about my loud, outspoken, foul mouth brand. And it was August 26th of 2010. And that's the day that I met Jason. I fell in love. And every day I got to wake up to a text message or a phone call or an email saying, good morning, beautiful. How are you today? Call in the middle of the day, do you know how awesome you are? Is anybody in there, in, the, in this room, graced enough with that in their lives? I, I see heads nodding. <laughs> that was the first time in my life that somebody looked at Erica Napolitano and said, you know what, you're good enough. I like you just the way you are. He didn't give me a hall pass. He challenged me at every turn, but he loved me for who I am. But there's also a second date that comes along with that, that made me really accept who I am and take a look at that. And that was October 10th, oh, sorry, October, I can't believe I screwed that date up. October 31st of 2010, and that's the day that Jason died. 29 years old, and I stood in a hotel waiting room, in a hotel, I keep saying it's a hotel, hotel, hospital, they both start with an H. I stood in a hospital waiting room and I collapsed into a man I'd only met two hours before when I heard the words, he's gone. The world fell out from under my feet. I didn't know who I was. I can't tell you how many days it was until I slept again without the help of some better living through chemistry. And I've spent every day since October 31st, 2010, thinking about Jason and what he brought to my life and reinforces about the power of unpopular. The worst thing that I ever did for my business and myself was thinking that I wasn't good enough and that thinking I had to be somebody else or build something else in order for people to look at me and go, you're okay, we like it, we dig it, we're picking up what you're putting down. And Jason is the first one who read the proposal for this book. He came through and he's like, I dig it. He called me out. He said, you talked about this, but you didn't carry it through here. And ironically enough, the day that I heard that, the, that Wiley wanted to publish my book was the day I was sitting at the Denver airport getting ready to board a plane to Iowa for his funeral. So the onus is on me not to be a downer for the rest of the presentation. It sucks that Jason died. But what it did is it gives me the ability to come in here and talk to you and go, you know what? There is something really cool about being unpopular and how probably 80% of the people in this room have an inside out definition or perception of what that word means. Unpopular isn't about being unlikable and we're gonna go into that as well. But the best part is, is I don't have to be the guy with the chicken head. Anybody else wanna? This is like something out of here family album? No. <laughs> family reunion when Uncle Bob's had a little too much to drink. But it's time to leave the playground. When we were growing up, we had this, po this view of what, uh, what popular meant ingrained into our heads. It was the kids with the cool shoes. They had all the new toys. They had girls, they had the Jordache jeans. Thank you for remembering Jordache jeans. <laughs> Gloria Vanderbilt, anyone? Thank you. Um, they, guys, they had the Z Cavarici pants. 
They shopped at Chess King. And they all had dates to the prom and homecoming long before anyone else. Is there anyone in this room who was the homecoming or the prom king or queen? And people are like, I ain't raising my hand. <laughs> she is coming after me with teeth. Well, that is good. Because that means everybody in this room actually has the opportunity to build a successful business and enterprise. Because you weren't raised to be a follower. Popular kids in school, they weren't leaders. They followed everything and everybody tagged along. If you weren't popular, you actually got equipped with a pretty cool set of tools. And that was you had to figure shit out for yourself. She said the S word. All right, there, we dropped it. All right. What was the over-under on that? Okay. You had to figure stuff out for yourself. <laughs> you had to figure stuff out for yourselves. Nobody was going to point you in one direction or the other. You had, to, you had to figure out how you were going to get to point A to point B. You had to find people who liked you so you had people to hang out with. And what that's done for us in the world of business is it's equipped us with a much better set of tools. Forbes actually came out with an article right when I was writing the proposal for this book, and it said, parents, guess what? Quit pushing your kids onto, you know, onto the sports field if that's not what they want. Your geek is poised for success. Your unpopular kid has an awesome set of tools. And if, um, could I get a manual slide advance? Because sometimes the network goes in and out. What we're going to do is, before we get into the five things that I feel create a really cool brand and place to be, I want to, find, I want to ask a question. How many people in here have iPhones? Oh, how do you feel about them? You hate them. What? You love them. You want to, you want to sidle on up next to them and spoon them in bed at night, don't you? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I like my iPhone. How many people here have Androids? Windows phones? Yeah, that's Ike. I did that just for him. He likes his Windows phone. How many people in here like the Atlanta Braves? There's like timid hands. It's like they're afraid to get stoned at the temple. Like, like a, what? Oh, how about, oh, oh, Roll Tide? Oh, that's emotional. University of Tennessee, how about the Vols? If I hear Rocky Top one more time, I will climb a clock tower. I will. I lived in Knoxville briefly. Um, da, 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 da. There were just some emotional responses in this room. There were people on both sides. People have emotional responses to things that they like. And people have emotional responses to your business as well. So when it comes down to building a brand, every brand that we just mentioned is inherently popular, excuse me, inherently unpopular with a very distinct demographic. It hasn't hindered their success though. So why are you building your business to be popular when in fact the exact opposite is what you should be doing. We're going to talk about the five things now that go into building an unpopular brand. We're going to start with personality. These two are not the same thing. I was talking about unpopular and unlikable. To me, the true difference between being unpopular and unlikable is best Best explained in a case study from over the last year. How many people in here are Netflix subscribers? Remember that nasty little decision they made without our input last year? Yeah, that is an unlikable decision. Unlikable decisions don't honor the people who allow them to be in business every day. Unpopular decisions are ones that businesses make in order to look ahead and honor the people who are actually bringing revenue in your door and, and like what you're doing and spread the word and share your message. The bottom line is, is you have to pick one. 
In a day and age where people do business with people before they do business with any brand, People don't do business with logos. They don't do business, business with PMS colors. They don't do business with Twitter accounts, Facebook pages, or websites. They do business with people. So if you're going to get out there and actually get business done, guess what? You need to develop a brand personality. And there's a couple of things that goes into that. First of all, as a brand, you have to figure out who you are. You're a human being, it's okay. And it's okay to bring that human side into your business because people are looking for that. They're looking in this day and age for somebody to connect with. You can walk into Walmart and connect with absolutely nothing in the process of getting things done. You, we connect with a price tag because that's what motivates the decision to walk into that store. You're not a commodity. We're gonna get into that a little bit later. But the beauty of building a brand that has a personality is that people look at you and they go, oh, she's the loudmouth red blogger who talked about whiny little freelancers. And they remember that and they have a visceral reaction to it. They either love it or they hate it. Don't build a brand for the middle. Indifference is going to kill you. And if you can, is there anybody in this room who can think about you know when they plan an event I'm just curious is there anybody that you sit down and you go you know what I really need to call Bob he is boring as all get out and I would love to have dinner with him <laughs> Bueller no we that's not how we plan our days and as a business you have just as much leeway whether you believe it or not to choose with whom you do business having a brand personality is telling your audience guess what I want to do business with people who like what I'm doing. I don't want to have to apologize for what I put out there or the way that I do business. But here's the thing, I will listen to you if you don't like something that I do and we're going to have a conversation about it. Unlikable decisions, unlikable businesses come back and they give you the, the bad finger on the previous slide. Unpopular decisions, remember, that what this means, it's not a you know, giant foam finger in a football game, but it, that finger means that, hey, you had an idea, and I'm gonna listen to it because you're gonna be pretty important to us later in the conversation. The second thing, what having a personality allows your brand to do is become approachable to your audience. Everything in this day and age is digital. If you're, don't, if you're not digital, you have a storefront. There are many successful businesses in this world that will never have a social media footprint or a web presence, and you know what? That's okay, because they're doing social media their own way with the people who walk through their front door. But having a personality makes you human, and since you can't have a conversation with a logo or a PMS color, people feel like they can talk to you. So you can't get to being approachable, and you can't tell people that as a brand you're approachable without putting out the welcome mat by using personality, by saying, hey, I'm cool, sit down, grab a cup of coffee, we'll have a conversation, in whatever vernacular that your brand chooses. By having a personality and extending the fact that, hey, we can have a conversation, people realize that they be can become a part of your brand. Think about your favorite businesses online and how they put themselves out there. Think about their Facebook pages, think about their Twitter feeds, their LinkedIn accounts, their blogs in the comments section. The best brands have conversation. And through those conversations, people become, come to have an ownership in those brands because you're listening. And you know what? I get pissed off when I find out all these big name bloggers turn off their blog comments. Because what they're doing is they're saying, I'm going to broadcast. That's lovely. If I could get you on my DVR, I would fast forward through you. They have a 
responsibility to their audience that they have walked away from. And while people might retweet the Dickens out of their blog posts and their messages and their books, God bless them. But you make it an awful lot harder for people to stick around, stay around, and keep coming back and bring their friends when you turn off the phone so nobody can invite you to the party. How are people supposed to reach you? Think about that. If people can't become a part of your brand's conversation, how are they going to play a little game of pass the sheep <laughs> and share you with their friends and people that they know and trust? I don't know about you, but pretty much, I would say 85% of the business that I do in my life now comes from me going, hey, I need a blank. Can somebody tell me where to get one? I see a lot of heads nodding. If you turn that off, that's how business gets done. And people want to share brands that make them feel good. They want to be, we, we all, we're all inherently altruistic. We want to share links, we want to share resources, share restaurants we found, great coffee drinks, destinations, great people that we should introduce to you because we want to be the source of that information. It's a little egotistical, but it's how we're wired as human beings. How good do you feel when you get to walk up to somebody after, that you haven't seen in a couple months and they go, Mark, I am incredibly grateful that you introduced me to Judy because she has been an invaluable asset to our organization. She connected me with so-and-so. She's now, we just hired her. She introduced me to Blank and we brought him on board. Or she, you know, she referred me over to a restaurant and we're doing an event there. That makes you feel good. So getting your brand out there and encouraging it to be shareable is a combination of that personality and that approachability because that's what makes people want to share you because nobody, is there anybody in here who feels good about somebody coming back and go, hey, you know what, that restaurant, it sucked. Hey, I'm so glad I could give you that referral. Polish your nails on your lapel. No, we don't want to share things that suck because that makes us look bad, especially in a work environment. How many times have you seen one of those, I'm going to raise my hand, email exchanges where you have to send an email to somebody that you referred business to and, and you've said, hi, so Mary got back to me and she said that you totally went off the grid on her. I went out of my way to refer you this business because I trusted you with one of my clients. Would you mind getting back to her? Thank you. Undertone, bless your heart. <laughs> There's a middle finger in there. <laughs> it's a big middle finger in there. Does anybody enjoy sending one of those emails or having one of those phone conversations? Being a shareable brand and building that foundation is, is so important. And the reason it's unpopular is because when you make yourself shareable, people are going to share back, and you might not like what it is that they have to say. I spoke at a conference in Denver this past weekend. Um, it was called uh, Starfest. Any sci-fi nerds, comic book geeks in here? Thank you. OK, so I was in um, a conference filled with people dressed up as Star Trek characters. and. Um, if you want, I'll come show you the picture later of the girl who had the, um, the Yoda backpack. It was adorable. Not. Um, <laughs> but I was in this room, and this guy came up to me, uh, and he goes, yeah, yeah, I stopped by your blog. This is what his face looked like. Stopped by your blog. Felt like I needed a warm shower after leaving there, not a cold shower. He said, you're kind of chilly, kind of, I wasn't ready to get drug across the railroad tracks. And there's two things I could have done. Well, you, you know, well, what post did you read? And, and why do you feel that way? And my response was, you know what, I don't claim to be for everybody. And if you aren't picking up what I put down, there's a whole lot of other places out there that'll give it to you. But what happened after that exchange is he sat in on my presentation 
And he came up to me afterwards. He's like, you know what? I'm going to go back to your blog now that I've met you, now that I've heard you speak. And I'm like, thanks. <laughs> thanks for giving me a second chance. But being approachable, I could have handled that two ways. I could have been a jerk about it and said, well, fine, if you don't like it, go somewhere else. Or I could just say, you know what, I'm not for everybody. Bless your heart. <laughs> but what being shareable does is something really cool happens to our businesses. You go out and you tell everybody about her business and then she does the same and then she does the same and then pretty before you know it you and her are both at the same event and you're both talking it up and then there's 10 people on her doorstep the next day and then she goes, oh God, I have more business than I can handle and now I have to grow. But Becoming scalable and understanding scalability is about one simple thing. It's not about making more faster. It's about how to grow your business so you continue to own your business and your business doesn't own you. Because growth is one of the leading reasons, strain from growth, why small to mid-sized businesses fail every day of the year. Because they don't put the infrastructure in place to handle this incredible personality that they've developed, putting out the welcome mat so people will come talk to them, people feeling welcome so they're happy to share the brand, and then now you have more business than you can handle. And naturally, that's when my notes blip out again. Awesome. Good thing I wrote a book on this. Scaling your business, some of the things that you need to remember are a pricing structure, a production structure, and the word that I mentioned earlier, your infrastructure. How many solo practitioners do we have in the room today? There's no right or wrong answer. How many people have businesses that are between two and 10 people? Another group. How many people work for corporations? Your corporations understood scalability. Everybody else in the room, and it's not that you don't, it's that in order to aspire to grow, those companies put an infrastructure in place. So you have to think big before you ever get big in order to put your business in a position to get there. And the reason scalability relates to the concept of unpopularity is that there are some really tough decisions that come along with growing a business. And they are not always the easiest ones to make. I have more and more clients every day who discontinue offering or making certain products in order to have operating reserves to feed their cash cows so that they can continue to grow. I have companies that go through layoffs, most unlikable term in the world to a lot of people, but an unpopular decision when it comes to allocating cash resources and operating costs so that they can continue to thrive two, five, ten years into the future. They decide to take feedback from their clients and customers and go, you know what, we totally hear you. We know that you want this, this feature added to our product, but we're actually going to shift direction. How many people in here have a brand that they know and admire that shifted direction in the past three years or so? Maybe? No? Nobody? Nobody. Okay, we'll skip shifting direction because nobody does that. We're going to go NASCAR. We're going to go fast and turn left. One direction. Um, but what happens when you go through and make those decisions that allows your business to scale there's a trimming away process. That trimming away process leaves some pretty cool things behind where you look at them and you go, yeah, buy a thing that I had so much fun building. Buy a thing that I drained my 401k to fund. <laughs> and look at it in your personal life. Buy a person that I invested three years of my life with <laughs> that your family loved and is really disappointed and tells you time and again, time and again, why aren't they coming to Thanksgiving dinner, but not like I've ever had that happen. You look at things like that and you go, 
What has to fall away in order for me to get where I need to go? Very unpopular decisions for a business to make. And the final thing that happens is when you develop a killer brand personality and people are, people are walking through your front door and then they share you with 83 of their friends and you find that, hey, we've got a business that grows and you've got cash coming in the door, but we have to be profitable. Profitable. There's two kinds of profitability. It's not just the financial side, it's the emotional side as well. There is not a single person in this, is there anybody in here, this is a poll, that is still at the job that they started when they graduated high school? And there is gasps and laughs of exasperation. That really wasn't a joke. I was really, I've actually had people raise their hands and I'm like, earmuffs, cover your ears, this doesn't apply to you. Becoming profitable is about making those decisions that this job sucks and I've got to leave it. But it's paying for my kids' school, pays for daycare, pays my mortgage, it pays my car, it pays my utilities. That is a tough decision to face. But let's start with the money side of things. So, this is the one with the animation. Q notes. That is what you run. You're not here to give things away for free, and we all get the emails, maybe once a week, from a friend that goes, hey, Mr. Web Designer friend of mine, I was wondering if you could pop over and take a look at my website, because somebody came and, came and blew it up, and I was wondering if maybe you had some time so you could fix it up for me, and you're like, I can for $175 an hour. You run a business and not a free clinic. If you don't price your services appropriately, you're gonna find yourself in a position where you are working for free, where your outgo is more than your income, so your pricing structure is key. Cash money. Is there anybody in here who has a mortgage company who accepts wishes and unicorns as payment? <laughs> Nobody ever raises their hand. Here's the thing, and it's hot in here. Cash money levels the playing field. I give you stuff, you give me money. You go to buy a car, you give them cash, they give you a car. You go to the doctor, you give them a co-payment, they give you treatment. You go to a restaurant, you give them cash, you give, they give you food. Is there anybody who gets up in the morning and goes to work for free? The bottom line is no. Cash is king. And think about how you're charging your clients for your services and how much you're willing to give away for free in order to get to what pays your bills. Ask me how I feel about trade. BS, and here's why. Because inevitably, when you engage in trade, if you're not smart about it, and honestly, most of us aren't, you don't treat it like a business decision. You don't treat it like a business contract. You don't say, I am going to come over, what is your name? Melanie. Melanie, Melanie I am gonna come over to your house, and I am going to give you four hours of cleaning. I don't do windows. I'm going to give you four hours of cleaning, and during that four hours, what that is, is I have an $80 per hour charge, so that is a $320 value. And in exchange, you are going to give me $320 worth of graphic design services, which you may or may not be a graphic designer, so that might be a really shitty deal for me. <laughs> but you are going to give me $320 of graphic design services and you charge $100 an hour for that, so it's roughly three point in hours of work. That is how trade gets done. What we usually do is go, hey, will you build me a website if I work on your car? And on the other side, somebody ends up feeling super shafted. Nobody's ever felt that way. 
And you laugh because you have. It's happened with friends. It happens in business. It happens if you work in a corporate environment. It happens with your colleagues. Hey, you know what? I'll take that report if you take this task. And then you're like, dude didn't do this task. And now I'm left with task and report. Make it a business contract. And I'll go back and I'll say that trade isn't BS. If you're building a business designed to compete on price, you're already losing. Value is where you compete. There are 15 people in this room that do the exact same thing, possibly more. But you're all able to hang out in the same room and not stab each other, at least not in public. So the differentiation between your services first, instead of setting with a pricing model, it has to be what value are we offering our customers for the price that we, are off, that, that we sell our services at? I have a standard phrase that I use when people come back to my company and they say, well, such and such company will do it for X, and it's less. I say, well, you're more than happy to compare our services and the value that you feel that you receive for both, but you can get a lot crappier work for a whole lot more money. And as soon as I say that, the discussion ends. Usually we win the business. The people that we don't want to do business with walk out the door. The most important thing is, is you don't have to say it exactly the way I do because you're not me and I'm not you. And that's a really beautiful thing because me is already taken. So is you. So find the way to have that conversation and put yourself in a position of power when it comes to the negotiations for what the value is for the services that you provide. And if you have not, I'm going to use the F-bomb, earmuffs. If you have not seen Mike Montiero's Vimeo presentation called Fuck You, Pay Me, you are cheating yourself. It's a roughly 40 minutes. And the reason it has this particular not so nice title is be Goodfellas. Everybody seen Goodfellas? OK, remember? F you, pay me. He takes lines from Goodfellas. He leads it in. But it's the single-handedly, has anybody else in here, has anybody seen it? So it's probably, Dave, it's probably one of the best presentations on the value of contracts for anyone, no matter what type of business that you do, because contracts are about protecting both parties and establishing both value, price, as well as, as remedies for both parties when you're going through any sort of dispute process, which you hope doesn't happen, but inevitably it does. When I sat down and I built contracts for my business, it took me losing $40,000 in one year to two separate clients. Shame on me for trusting somebody. Shame on you for letting me trust you. Shame on me for not getting it done after the first time. I recently lost business from a new client because I sent them my contract. And they're like, ooh, this is pretty heavy duty. And I was like, do you have any questions? I'm more than happy to answer it for you. I can send you a one-page summary of all of the fine points. Um, if it wasn't attached to the front of the contract, which I know it was, and um, what can I help you with? They're like, yeah, we don't want to do business with you because this contract is a little, yeah, it seems kind of contentious. And I was like, OK, thank you. Watched a $10,000 contract walk right out the door. Found out next week they contacted three colleagues of mine in the same, in, the same, uh, in Denver for the same services. And they said, Erica, weren't you working with these people? I was like, no, we don't have a contract. They wouldn't sign one. And they're like, oh, good to know. So think about that when you want to build your business. I'll ask you this question, because this is for you to answer. What is it? Nobody knows. It's a cupcake from a company called Chicken, which is awesome, by the way. I was like, are they chicken flavor? It's like chicken and waffles. I love chicken and waffles. My suit doesn't like chicken and waffles, because I got to fit into it. The answer to this question is a loyal audience. Chris Brogan has an excellent phrase, and I steal from him repeatedly. 
I do credit him all the time, so it's not technically theft. Build a following, and they'll watch you fall on a sword. Build a community, and they'll fall on the sword for you. When things get tough in the, in the marketplace, from Yelp reviews to blog comments, to people getting in your face on Facebook and Twitter, or in your place of business, your audience that has come to know and love you is your best defense against somebody who says, yeah, I don't like them. This weekend when I was at that conference, everybody in the room hated Apple as a company. I really didn't know how to counter that, because I'm like, wow, so much hate in one room. But the best defense is people like me who don't blindly love the brand, and I've been critical of Apple over the past couple of years, but I'm, I'm still going to buy their products when I choose, and I'm still going to be critical. And that's the best that you can ask for as a business person, as a business owner, and as a human being. When is the last time, I just want a show of hands, who's gone out to dinner with a group of two or more people in the past month? Social people, I love it. The rest of you just stay home with Cheetos and your dogs, I understand. And episodes of The Walking Dead or Mad Men. Um, or The Deadliest Catch, I'm totally into that now. I so want to go crab fishing. But they don't let women on the boats because they're bad luck, so that dream is totally blown out of the water. Anyways, um, but when you go out to dinner, did anybody have an instance where you agreed, where everybody around the table agreed with everything that was said during that hour, hour and a half. This guy up here, he's just like, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. But there were, there were lively, intelligent conversations. And sometimes, depending on how much we've had to drink, the conversations get not so intelligent and somebody's ready to put tinfoil on their head and go naked down the street. But that usually only happens at South by Southwest. But you can have intelligent discourse and not agree with everything that's around the table. I talked earlier about building for the middle, and it's the worst thing you can do for your brand. Because the friends in your life aren't middle of the road. You pretty much know where they stand. And you care for them, and you keep them in your life because of what they bring to their life and your life and who they are. Businesses have to look at their customers the same way. If you build for the middle, and I can say this because I'm in the South, when you're driving down, the freeway, what do you see laying in the middle of the lane? Road kill. Dead possum. On the left side, you're safe. On the right side, you're safe. In the middle of the road is where you get killed. So don't build for the middle. When you're, when you're trying to be a popular brand, that's who you're building for, the middle. And sooner or later, somebody's going to come along and crush you like an armadillo, middle of the Texas panhandle. Growing up in Houston, I have seen more than my fair share of dead armadillos, and they will mess up the undercarriage of your car. Try explaining to your mother that you have $1,200 worth of damage to the underside of your Pontiac Sunbird because you hit the third armadillo that month. <laughs> it wasn't one of my best months. but. Pick an opinion, have a stance. And if you're afraid of people not liking what you have to say, maybe you're in the wrong business. Because what happens is the people in your life don't always agree with you, but they're not gonna go, hey, I am, I'm done with you. I'm out of here because I don't like what you have to say. And if they leave good on them, you want the people sticking around who are willing to have a dialogue with you to tell you what they love and what they don't love. That's how brands get better. By making unpopular decisions that honor their audience and get you to the point of being able to have that ongoing open dialogue with your audience. So now I'm going to finish up, then we're going to go into a Q&A. There are three books. Mine is not one of them. Shocker. That I think every business person should read. First is The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. I, I just got a, yeah. I don't think I've ever heard a holler. 
<laughs> for Paulo Coelho before. He's a Portuguese author. This book has sell, sold over, I think, 17 million copies worldwide. It is a fable, complete fiction, about following your dreams. The book is maybe a quarter of an inch thick, but it will take you, hopefully, at least a week to read because you'll get to points in it and you'll go, whew, all right, going to go mow the lawn. When's the last time you said that? <laughs> Except when you're... Your significant other was nagging you when you wanted to get out of the house. The second book is the last lecture. If as some of you might have seen the last lecture online, you can go to YouTube and Google it. You can Google it on YouTube. Facepalm. Actually, they're owned by the same company, so you can Google it on YouTube. But it is probably the best 72 minutes you'll ever spend of your life. You won't leave with a dry eye and it'll be tears well shed. You can also buy the book, which is why it's up there. The third book is Flat Stanley. I grew up with Flat Stanley. And today, um, Flat Stanley could be seen by some activist organizations as cruelty or child abuse, because what happens is Stanley gets in the way of a steamroller, and he gets flattened. And his parents are like, what, well, what do we do if Stanley's flat? And Stanley's like, I'm flat. So he adapts, and he finds that he can slide under doors, and he can, go, he can fold himself into a letter and send himself places. For me, it's a beautiful story about the, the adaptive nature and the entrepreneurial spirit, spirit about how all of us unpopular kids get things done. And I ask, I'll finish up today by saying and asking, if you understand the one reason, no matter where you work, for whom you work, or what you do, that the reason you, if you know the reason you get to be in business tomorrow. Bueller? Nobody. It's not because you have the coolest product in Silicon Valley. It's not because you have the flashiest website or the coolest business cards. It's not because you have the, the prime piece of corner real estate in the hottest part of town. It's because your customers allow it to happen. They are the single reason anybody in this room gets to wake up tomorrow and do what they love. Or, if you're one of those people, do what you hate for the paycheck. Because if they don't come back, there's nobody to pay your salary. So think about that. Something I have to remind myself about every day, that while the customer isn't always right, they are the reason I am grateful enough to get to do what I love on a daily basis. So oh, I want to open it up for Q&A. What? We have time for three questions, but I will be hanging out as long as you guys want to talk to me. Um, and. You know, it's time that we th rethink unpopular. I just like the fact that I've got a sheep with a brain over his head. I just like the slide. So hit me up with some questions. How can I help you? And more importantly, maybe there's somebody in this room who has a better answer to somebody's question than I do, and I want to find that as well. So I have no questions. I was that succinct and clear. I delivered the holy grail of presentations. She has a question. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, the part about security, and I would think you, you were liking it to having a job that provides X level of security and sort of makes life easy and mm -hmm. manageable. Um, can you talk a little bit more about kind of pushing beyond the limits of security? I mean, it could be anything from, I would think, a big account or a giant client or, you know, whatever. I look at it as it, it is a scary frickin' place to be when you have to get out of your comfort zone. But nothing cool ever happened in the closet at your house. Well, I haven't been. <laughs> I haven't been to your house. <laughs> and nor am I inviting myself over, because <laughs> that wouldn't be ladylike. But bless her heart. <laughs> there it is again. You have to get out and try things. And 
the coolest thing to me about trying things every day as a business owner and working with other companies who are trying new things is we go, all right, we have an awesome idea and we are going to throw it up against the fridge and see if it sticks like cooked spaghetti. And if it doesn't, the good news is, is that we all have dogs and the dogs will come around and eat the spaghetti that's fallen on the floor. That's failure and it's an incredibly powerful learning tool. So when you get out of your comfort zone, you get to, I, I, I am, I'm jazzed by failure because that's why, you know, when people ask how to, it's, it's the worst thing in the world when people say, well, how should I introduce you? You're a social media expert. I'm like, no, I'm not an expert at anything except screwing up royally and learning from my mistakes. If they put that on my, on my grave when I die, that's probably the best owed that anybody can give me is because I spent a life dedicated to figuring out what doesn't work so I can have the joy of figuring out what does. We all have those days where we walk away from our whatever office we call office and we go, I, there is not enough vodka in the world to fix this day. <laughs> But there are days we walk away and you go, I am higher than a kite because I figured out what works and it is working and it is moving and it's awesome and people love it. And then there's, this is the cool part where you never want to be right in the middle. You want to be pushing towards awesome or vodka. You can quote me on that. <laughs> Push towards awesome or vodka the whole time. And you know, just if you're pushing towards vodka, please don't drive. Yep. Amen. Tell me you don't run a free clinic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, because that's actually a, a profitable business model, but go ahead. <laughs> Absolutely, and here's the one tidbit I'll share with you. Give away the why, sell them the how. Think about that. Somebody smart, it's not my original thought, somebody smart said that to me way back when, and I remember, when you think of what to give away, give them the why they need it, and examples of the people who have done it, and sell them the how. That's why my book costs what it does, and there's examples of whys and hows in there, because you gotta buy that shit. <laughs> but I, this is Stacy standing next to me, um, wanting me to wrap it up. I am humbled that all of you shared your time with me today, and if it seems that I get a little misty-eyed when, when I say thank you, it's because those are the two most powerful words in my vocabulary. When I started being me through redhead writing, in 2008, I never imagined I would have the opportunity to go on a book tour. So, thank you. And, um, roll tide. <laughs>